You know, as we've said, this assumes that uh, you knew exactly what was going on, and that's grossly unlikely. Um, I'm going to look at this picture, and we'll see what went into it. Um, there are the issues of volcanoes and so on. Let, let, let's, let me show you what I want to do. Uh, even the IPCC, I should mention, when they do scenarios, do not use the GCMs. For the most part, they use very simple ocean, atmosphere, energy balance models because they have the time lag. They basically behave like the large models. So we'll use one such model. Here is the latest IPCC, you know, the radiative forcing. Um, these numbers probably are invisible to you, but fundamentally what is interesting to me is if you take the greenhouse gases, they are estimated with an interesting amount of uncertainty, even for CO2, uh, to give you about 2.93 watts per meter squared. And then they say that the total anthropogenic radiative forcing, on average, is about 2.29. They get that by subtracting the aerosols. Now, you will notice that although there are error bars, if you look carefully, the impact of aerosols has come down in this IPCC. And so has the uncertainty for the primary aerosols. The secondary aerosol effect due to aerosols uh, inf affecting clouds and so on is also considered to be small, but it has uncertainty. They list like this. They don't list this. This is in the text, and it's a nice example. The text says if you're dealing with ice clouds in the high troposphere, the effect can be the opposite sign. It can actually be to add to the warming rather than cooling. At any rate, let's take the total forcing. Remember, this is now 80 some odd percent of what you get from a doubling of CO2. So the whole discussion, you know, we're going to double CO2 by such and such a date, from the point of view of radiator forcing is largely irrelevant. We've reached it. And so let's see what, okay, total greenhouse forcing, crudely speaking, from 1800 to the present, looks like this for the total greenhouse forcing. Uh, E-folding is on the order of 40 to 60 years, reaches a little under 3 watts per meter squared. Now, in addition to this, all the simple models use some measure of volcanic forcing. Uh, most of the models use something developed by Sato at Goddard Institute for Space Studies. And you notice here, that's popping up, you know, to between 1 watt per meter squared and uh, it's interesting how volcanoes go. You have a cluster of volcanoes around Krakatoa in the late 19th century. Then have a period relatively free of major volcanoes. Then you have a cluster again. I don't give much significance to the clustering. Uh, you're all aware that a random process gives you clustering. The odds of getting things, if you're flipping a coin, head, tail, head, tail, is zero. There will always be runs. And so this you have in addition. And we'll see what that does. Here is the simple model we use. Uh, you have the flux. You have the emission. And then you have an ocean consisting in a mixed layer where you have instant mixing, a thermocline with diffusion, and upwelling or a bottom to the thermocline. Um, this is the model, type of model used in scenario building. Um, 
The forcing at the surface, you have to be careful. It's not radiative forcing. The only thing one is saying is the divergence of flux is zero. We're not saying the divergence of radiative flux is zero. So at the surface, it's mostly what is called latent heating, flux of water vapor, also flux of sensible heat or other components. It's the total that we're concerned with. And keep in mind, high sensitivity, long response times. OK, so here's the response to the volcanoes. Now, what's interesting about that is each of these curves represents a different sensitivity. So the lowest sensitivity is 0.75, used for a doubling of CO2. The highest is 5. That's the bottom curve here. The thing that's interesting about it is if you have low sensitivity, the volcanoes just appear as transient dips in temperature. If you look at the temperature record, you can't be certain, but you don't see anything other than dips in it. Whereas if you have a sensitive climate, it kind of says that there's a secular effect that you know the response, the decay, lasts longer and longer, and so it forms a platform for the next volcano and the next volcano. And so you're always building down. The interesting thing about it is if you have greater sensitivity than 3 degrees centigrade, uh, the volcanoes give you a net cooling of about a third of a degree already over the period you're looking at here. OK, this is the response to just the greenhouse gases. And so essentially, you're seeing the range from 0.5 or so to about 2 point something for the 5 degree centigrade. Now, of course, you're not seeing 5. You're only seeing half because it takes a long time. There is the delay due to the heat capacity of the simple ocean. Uh, nevertheless, the actual change, if you assumed everything were due to the processes we've mentioned, is uh, somewhere around here. So already these are much larger. Uh, if you add the greenhouse response to the volcanic response, you now reduce the difference between these because the volcanoes for the high sensitivity have also subtracted a great deal. But you're still way above what you expect here. Now, finally, all the models will end up agreeing with the observations. How do they do that? They do that by subtracting with aerosols, which they also call anthropogenic emissions, whatever they need to, to bring them into line. Well, with 0.75, you would need zero. Remember, we're accounting for all the temperature change by anthropogenic plus the volcanoes, which they include. By one and a half degrees sensitivity, you already have to subtract 25% of three. So you have around 0.7 watts per meter squared. Beyond this, you're having to subtract on over half of three. Remember, the IPCC best estimate for aerosols is 0.75. So, Essentially, you're already getting to the point where you're pushing the limits of what people think aerosols can do. Bjorn Stevens at the Max Planck is currently suggesting, and the paper is in review, so he doesn't want to be overly certain about it. He's suggesting that it's terribly unlikely that aerosols currently provide more than a half watt per meter squared. 
And at that point, sensitivities in excess of one and a half C are impossible unless natural internal variability is now used as the new fudge factor. You always have that. <laughs> Remember what I said, for the people who are advocating global warming, the only thing they need is the possibility, not that they made a correct prediction. <laughs> okay, now, the curious thing is, if you look at the data, there is no sign of the deep, prolonged response to volcanoes that indicate high sensitivity. Uh, but there's a curious thing, and I won't stress it too much, but the Hadley Center does complain that in 2009, they still had a problem of the influence of Krakatoa from 1883. Um, it wasn't strictly in temperature, but it's curious. <laughs> uh, moreover, the thing we have discussed very little is natural internal variability. Uh, what I mean by that, and this is important, we're keeping on talking what controls the climate. This may be the wrong question. Climate will vary without any forcing at all. I hope you all understand that. You don't need the sun. You don't need increased greenhouse gases. You'll still get ENSO. You'll still get Pacific Decadal Oscillation. You'll still get Atlantic Multi-Decadal Oscillations. And you'll still get ocean overturning due to the formation of deep water that can take a thousand years or more. Um, people attempted, Tung and Zhao, in a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in 2013, to try and estimate how much of the warming was due to, to natural internal variability. And they came to the conclusion that it was at least half. If that is the case, then if one went back, you would have to subtract double this to get agreement, at which point you'd be out of the realm of possibility. Uh, in a normal world, 